Okay, we are starting this webinar. We have the attendees starting to come in. Thanks everybody for spending time with us today. It is a gorgeous, or I, you know, it feels like October, a gorgeous mid-November um, fall day outside here in central Virginia. Beautiful. Okay, hello and welcome to session two of the Conversationalist, a winter webinar series that seeks to foster and nurture um, intensely deep and richly philosophical conversations around the co-creation of a much more beautiful world. Um, if you were not with us two weeks ago during uh, the inaugural session with Brandon Sheard and his thoughts via his, his philosophy, The Farmstead Meets Myth, you can head over to our website, robiniainstitute.com to watch the full replay. Uh, it was a truly powerful conversation about the descaling and humanizing of the regenerative movement. And I think if you were not there live that you would great, greatly appreciate watching watching that replay. Again, you can get that at the robiniainstitute.com. Today, uh, November 9th is a very exciting day for us. This webinar has been two years in the making. Uh, it is titled Rededicating Regeneration, Holistic Management and the Wellspring of Abundance. We have the true pleasure uh, of having Alan Savory with us this afternoon. Um, I typically don't sweat when I talk to people on webinars and podcasts, um, uh, but it, it is truly a pleasure. I'm a little bit nervous, Alan, I have to be honest with you. Um, the, the upcoming conversation I hope is as deep and as philosophic as the ones you and I have had privately, and I'm sure it's gonna have an, an impact uh, to everybody here. Um, it, it is a strange thing before we begin, I wanna make the note, uh, I have this strange role that I feel like I should introduce you. and it, it, it kind of seems like one, you don't need the introduction, um, but but also two, I, I'm, I'm learning as I get to know you better that it doesn't seem like you want the introduction. And uh, and so in, in that in that theme, what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna tell everybody what the, the, the most um, rewarding lesson is that you ever taught me. And, um, and, and it's not about regenerative agriculture, holistic management, managing complexity, systems, design, water cycle. It's not, has nothing to do with any of that. Um, you actually handed me this yesterday during, during our preliminary practice call for today. And it's how to introduce myself. Um, that, that comment, you probably didn't mean to change my life, but you did. Um, and so in, in that theme and in, in that regard, what I want to do is start with myself and then I'll introduce you. Um, my name is Daniel Griffith. I am an undeserving father to three wild children and an unfit husband to the most wonderful wife this world has to offer. Um, I am a farmer and I seek to nourish my community. Alan, uh, your work speaks for itself, but you are also a father, a husband, and an active member and co-creator of your community, our community, all over the world. And for that, um, we thank you. Thank you. We thank you. Um, so this, this webinar, if, if it continues, we'll, we'll go for about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit less, a little bit uh, more, depending on, on the nature of the conversation. Uh, I hope it is more conversation-based than lecture and or interview-based. I'm not an interviewer. I, I like conversations, and so I hope it takes that turn. And so with a, with a webinar titled Rededicating Regeneration, I think a very apt place to start um, is with a very modest question. And, and that is, Alan, to you, what is regenerative agriculture? Let's define that before we continue using it. It would be um, a form of agriculture that uh, addresses the root cause of agriculture having failed and led to the failure of more than 20 civilizations. So it's an agriculture that truly regenerates economies, communities, cultures, societies, and sustains humans, because agriculture is the basis of everything. Without agriculture, you can't have a choir, orchestra, church, army, company, business, or anything. So, so we have to actually develop a regenerative agriculture. Now, having said that, that's, that's an ideal. Now, if it's to address the reason why 
agriculture today is the most destructive industry ever in the history of mankind, even more destructive than coal and oil and all the things being blamed uh, for climate change. Uh, if we're to address that, then the agriculture will have to be uh, agriculture where food and fiber is produced by people managing the complexity of cultures, society, and economy, the three things we manage. So that really means it has to be managed holistically. It can no longer be reductionist management because that is what has led to the situation we face today. Mm. So if we had to summarize that, it would be agriculture uh, that is managed holistically, meaning we're managing the complexity of society, economies and nature, and is truly sustaining civilization and all our cultures, etc. Wow. You you said at the beginning of that that without agriculture we can't have a choir. Um, I want to unpack that maybe a little bit because to me that's not entirely clear. I mean, without agriculture, we can't have food and therefore we can't rejoice and sing because we're dead, right? Lack of nourishment. I don't necessarily think that's what you mean, though. Could, could you dive into that a little bit? Well, what I'm meaning is without the production of food, you cannot have the organization that leads to having a choir or a church or a university or a government. You, you can't have anything beyond sustaining families. Now, when we've had to abandon civilizations in the past, people have sustained themselves and small cultures, pastoral cultures, cultures in the Amazon, etc. but they weren't able to sustain city-based civilization. So I hope that gets it to you. They, you can't have an economy, uh, or any institution, which is what civilization and churches and everything are based on. Wow, that that makes sense. That makes sense. Let's let, let's pat, unpack that a little bit more. Let's talk um, in, in relevance to climate change, right? So right now, the COP twenty six conference is proceeding as it has uh, in years past. Um, you know, it, it, it forces the idea of climate change into a very present reality. And I don't mean that either positively or negatively, but you can't open Instagram, Facebook, you can't participate in a social circle today, it seems, as long as that circle has anything to do with agriculture or, or, or allows it to have anything to do with agriculture uh, without, you know, seeing this, con this conference or just climate change in general. Um, but, but it's interesting, we, you know, we live in a world that I think maybe was only an, an imagination in the imagination of yours many years ago, right? Regeneration, regenerative, regenerative meats, regenerative agriculture or farming um, is a term that occupies a very common vernacular. Um, you know, you can go to the grocery store, the local farmer, the local farmer's market, you can buy meat online and all of it can be regenerative. That, that's what I mean by the common vernacular. My, my question is, we understand what regeneration is. We understand what an agriculture that is regenerative is, at least in definitional terms, based upon the early stints of this conversation. But, but what I'm trying to ask here is this, why does it need rededication or rediscovering or a unity factor or a better definition? Why well, do we need this conversation? I, we need it to keep it pure, let's call it to keep it to truly being regenerative agriculture, because the word is becoming bandied around and meaningless. People are talking about regenerative tourism, regenerative hunting, regenerative agriculture, regenerative everything. And in the same way, sustainable became abused and green became, you know, greenwashing. And I, I'm afraid the same is happening to regeneration. As far as I know, the term regenerative agriculture, I always credit Bob Rodale with it, because about the time, this is about 35 years ago, whenever it was, um, I had just produced a, a tape, a fellow called uh, Brown had uh, produced this videotape, Sustaining Civilization, because I said the problem isn't agriculture, it's how to sustain civilization with agriculture, because we can sustain communities but not, not cities. 
And when we've abandoned the cities before, we've been able to sustain our communities, as we said. So I was talking about how we could have a new agriculture that would sustain civilization. And I would met Bob Rodale, he'd come and stayed with me. I'd taken our staff, gone and stayed with him. And we were talking about this new form of agriculture that might have to take the best of the old, best of the new. We didn't know what it would really entail. And um, he used the word regenerative, saying it's, it's going to have to regenerate communities, economies, small towns, et cetera. And I love that word. And that was the first I ever heard it. And that's why I always credit Bob with it. So now if we're to keep it doing that, I'm afraid a lot of what is being promoted today as regenerative agriculture, it's, it's hard to be critical of it because the people are well-meaning, uh, but there's very little difference uh, in the end result between a friendly bull in a china shop and an angry bull in a china shop. They're gonna have the same effect. So there are a lot of people in the regenerative movement today that are actually, in my view, doing damage. What they're promoting is just new agri, what they see as new agricultural practices, but they're not new. They were practiced 2000 years ago by Nabataean civilizations and things like that, and they failed. So what's the point in promoting them now? There's very little in the, in the practices that is actually new, that hasn't been done over the last 10,000 years of incredibly creative farmers in all cultures around the world. So uh, we need to, I don't know whether it's to define it or something, but try to prevent it being watered down to becoming meaningless, because then God help humanity. If we don't learn now how to address the cause of desertification, megafires and climate change, in which agriculture is the biggest single player uh, I believe, if we don't address that cause of that now, there will be nothing but a violent future uh, that we can't even imagine today. It will be so bad. We're not going to mitigate against climate change. That's like telling our grandchildren to sit in the boiling water or in the hot water as we slowly boil the pot. They need to jump out of the bloody pot and we need to do it now. So, so we must prevent regenerative agriculture watering down to meaninglessness. Now, none of us, least of all mean, know how to do that. I know that it needs to be addressing that cause. Therefore, the farmers and the government policies through which we manage at scale have to all be uh, guided, not by our management of the last million years, where all, almost every human, including everybody listening to us today, I can pretty well guarantee that every one of us participating today has made 99% of the decisions in our lives or on our farms to meet a need, a desire, or to solve a problem. It's incredibly difficult to think of a decision that you didn't make in that context and with that reason. And that is the cause of agriculture being so destructive. So if we have people promoting, let's say what we believe to be good practices that are based on the biological sciences and not on corporate marketing, technology, chemistry, et cetera, if we promote these good practices, but the reason for the practice and the context in which we do it is to meet a need, a desire or solve a problem, we are then part of the problem when it's not going to be regenerative, because that is reductionist management. You cannot take the complexity of society and cultures and the complexity of economies and the complexity of nature, which are absolutely inseparable, and reduce that to meeting a need, a desire, or addressing a problem. That is the cause of past agriculture having led to so many civilizations failing. So, so we need our, our, our management uh, needs to be in a holistic context. That makes sense. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to stop you there. Um, I feel like I have about five different 
tangents I want to go down and have you address for like a webinar in, the, in and of themselves. So I'm trying to find an order here because we only have so much time. Um, let, let's talk about that, though, in regard to a very modern pressing problem, right? So the foundation of being the problem within the agricultural system, right, is making decisions based on need, desire, and the ability or the, you know, the idea of solving problems. If that's true, could we translate that to the climate change COP26 discussions happening today? It, it seems very reactionary, right? These are the problems. What do we have to do to fix them, right? That's reductionist. Uh, but it's also reactive, right? And in, it seems to me like managing holistically, which I want to get into um, here in, in, in just a couple of minutes, is, is understanding complexity, right? That when you're managing complexity, you're not reacting to it, right? You are part of the system and therefore we can you know, we can have that conversation, but to me, we have that reaction versus proactive sort of understanding. Um, can you address that with, anyways, climate change and COP26? Uh, you, you said so much there that let me try to unpackage it a, a, a little bit. You, you said making decisions to meet needs, desires, or address a problem would cause, cause the problem. Now, th that causes a problem when those are both the reason and the context for the decision. But if you adopt or accept the new concept of developing a holistic context, a new concept, not in any branch of philosophy, science or religion and in the world, if you adopt that concept where we tie our life, how it has to be to our life supporting environment and behavior, and that becomes the context for your decisions. Now, you will still have to make decisions to meet needs, desires, and solve problems. They're not the issue. The issue is that they are the context and the reason. So when you manage holistically, you will still have that reason, and you'll still be making decisions always to meet your needs, your desires, or solve problems. But now you'll do it in a holistic context which is constantly bringing you back to that complexity of culture, environment, and economy. So that, that's it. Now, when, when you talk about reactive, et cetera, it, it, this again is how we've got to somehow stop people watering it down. Um, my work, some of it on, on just the grazing aspect, is now by academics called adaptive multipadic grazing. This is, excuse my French, but bullshit. Because holistic management, when you manage holistically, it's proactive. The adaptive management is the oldest management known to mankind, where we do things, assume we're right, find we're wrong, adapt and, and change and do it again, etc. Now, the moment you're managing holistically and you're opening your mind to all science, all knowledge, you're making your decisions in this holistic context for you, your family, or whatever it is that's being managed, and you open your mind to all the science and so on, now you're, you're making your actions in that context. And at the end of the day, no matter how much it is supported by science, research, experience, everything else, um, you assume you're wrong. So that you, on that assumption, monitor for the earliest sign of where it's going wrong so that you can proactively manage. Now that comes out sometimes with questioning. This might help listeners. Sometimes if, if I'm helping somebody, let's say they've got a, a mixed farm and they also like wildlife, deer or something. And they might say to me, Alan, if I manage holistically on my farm, what's going to happen to my deer? That's totally the wrong question. That is the question for anybody advising you on reductionist management, because you don't know what the hell is going to happen to the deer. If you're managing holistically, I would bounce that back at you and say, well, what do you want to happen? Do you want to increase the deer? Do you want to decrease the deer? What are you wanting? Because we're going to proactively bring it about to the best of our ability. You see, it's, it's proactive management. So I hope those two points help, that it's not reactive, it's highly um, proactive, and uh, you will always be making decisions to meet needs, desires, or solve problems, but need to do so in a holistic context. Wow. 
Wow, I'm, lo I'm lost in it and I thank you. Um, so a question I think could be, could you call yourself a regenerative farmer and build soil or create a deer habitat or not a deer habitat accidentally uh, without purpose? And is that a truly regenerative system in the foundational understanding of what is regenerative? But again, these, these things are all loaded. If I understood your question right, could you be practicing and be a regenerative farmer? It's almost impossible to do today. Let me explain why. And I did explain why in, in the talk I gave at COP26 just about an hour ago. And I said, as individuals, we can choose to change the light bulbs, ride a bicycle to work, etc. Okay, and we can manage at the human scale on our farms and so on, but only up to a point. So you and I could be farmers, and we could be making our decisions holistically to the best of our ability. But we are operating in an economy that is dictated by other people at government level, at policy level, in a global economy that is driving environmental destruction. So with the best will in the world, you and I cannot be regenerative farmers. We have to tackle this at a bigger scale, as I was saying in my COP very brief talk, which you can probably pass on to people, I was saying we have to tackle this at the institutional scale. And only when we are managing at the large scale, institutional scale, will we begin to be able to truly be regeneratively farming. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, let, let's, let's, let's go there for a second. Let's go there for a second. Let's talk about agricultural policy, right? You were talking at the institutional scale. What, what is the role? I think you know, in this greater regenerative movement, if we can call it that, there's a lot of subsets of call them belief systems, right? You have the, we need to regenerate the subsidy system. I'm, I'm talking as an American citizen here. We need to regenerate the American subsidy system. We need to, you know, fix the souls and hearts of, you know, commercial farmers. We need to screw uh, the United States government and do it ourselves, right? We need to form local little tribes or communes, you know, right? There's all of these different avenues, all of these different belief subsets that I think tackle this global problem. Um, but, but is there a role that agricultural federal policy could play in the creation of a regenerative future? It's the only thing that can play a role. There's nothing else that can. So if you were to go to listen to COP26 going on at the moment, all the stuff I did in, in the regenerative agricultural segment, it's people promoting what we should do, what we should do, and I can't disagree with any of it. The stuff we should be to preserving cultures and minority groups and um, all the things we should do. So there are thousands of people telling world leaders what they should do. And a lot of it's right, but. But as you're telling people what they should do, other people are telling them what they should do. And it's just a cacophony of voices and confusion. And they, there's not a political world leader that has any idea what to do in that massive noise. Right? So how could you put it right? We need to put it right. We can only do so at scale. That means you go, you're beyond the human scale. Now you're at the institutional scale through environmental organizations, farming organizations, universities, governments, United Nations, etc., at institutions. Now, institutions are one of the three things we're managing. You see, we produce millions of things. We produce beef, wine, sheep, wool, leather, timber, fish from the oceans. We produce food, many, many forms, and people are arguing about that, how to produce food. We produce cars, cell phones, bombs, buildings, orchestras, music, churches, space exploration vehicles. Now, all these things we produce, they're not the problem because it's management that is the problem. So all the things we produce stop if we stop producing. If you stop producing food, it stops. All the things we produce do what they're intended to do. A watch tells the time, food feeds you, etc. Now, if then that's not where the problem lies, if we acknowledge 
that the problem is due to management, how humans are managing resources, then you've got to look at the three things we manage. And then you come back to just humans, our institutions, our economy and nature. Now, the institutions are themselves being managed. And you've virtually got the fox managing the chicken coop. Because institutionals, institutions have what we call wicked problems. That means they're not evil, but they're almost impossible to solve. Uh, one is desertification. For over 10,000 years, we didn't know how to solve desertification. We discovered how to in the 1960s, right? But institutions, not one, not even a cattleman's organization has yet accepted it over half a century later. That's because institutions take on a life of their own mm. and they defend the prevailing thinking. So if you get new discoveries, if they're genuinely new discoveries, there's excitement and there's discussion and there's debate and then there's acceptance within a decade or so. Now, if you get a different type of discovery, which is where somebody discovers something that goes in the face of thousands of years of human belief, then you get the opposite practice. What institutions now do is to fiercely defend the, the beliefs. And this takes a hundred years or more to, to overcome. So part of the reason we're having so much problem today is it's through institutions that we manage economies and through those we manage nature or the environment in our agriculture. Now, if you're going to break the cycle of global desertification, megafires and climate change spiraling out of control as they are, you cannot break that cycle at the fires level. You cannot break it at the climate change level because you'll never reverse climate change. You can only hope to slow it down now. Okay, the only point at which you can break that cycle is at the desertification level but we can't even, I bet you that's not even being discussed at COP26, not even being discussed. Why? Because institutions have been blocking the knowledge for half a century. So, so we you see, we have a real difficulty there. That's why today, when I spoke in my short little sideshow, as it is at COP, I just came down to a very simple suggestion that could hopefully lead us forward, where we could get around this institutional blockage to new knowledge. Now, it's not the only one. There are two others that I think we could solve if we began managing holistically. The other two institutional difficulties we have, and we have to have organizations that are our only efficient way of doing things on scale, the, the other two things are, if um, a person does something wrong, they can fairly readily accept it, apologize, move on. For an institution to admit error is extremely difficult. What happens is they circle the wagons and protect the institution. And you've only got to look at Catholic Church and pedophile priests to see that. Uh, they'll go against the very mission of a wonderful organization to protect the organization and not the innocent children. And they'll do that for a couple of centuries. So it's not because they're bad, it's because it's an institutional wicked problem. Now there's, uh, there's another one, and that is a lot of what we say and we talk about, you said it just now, that makes sense. Almost everything we say will just be common sense to most people. Now, institutions are almost incapable of common sense. And if the example I commonly use is if you asked almost anybody in America, does it make sense for us to produce coal and oil uh, to grow uh, grain to produce fuel? And people would say, no, that, that's stupid. Well, then why are thousands and thousands of brilliant minds working in institutions doing that. And it's because institutions are almost incapable of common sense. So we've got some real difficulties. We've got a couple of new bits of knowledge 
that we need to get into society that individuals can grasp very, very quickly without difficulty, but institutions resist. Um, the, and then we've got this inability to use common sense and inability or difficulty in admitting error. So we've got some real difficulties there that I don't have solutions to, but we need to acknowledge them. They're not invented by me. These come from the social sciences, the research, etc. And we know this about institutions, but we're not heeding it. So what I did today uh, to, to take this constructively, because I, I cannot bear uh, discussions that just become destructive and critical, um, to try and make this really constructive, what I suggested today is that we just take agriculture as the point at which we can break that cycle as our first case, then we can do energy and other policies later, but take one small nation <clears throat> somewhere in the world and let them carry on government as usual, policy development as usual, and then on the side, just concurrently have them use us at Savory Institute to provide the facilitation skill and have their experts, their people, develop policy in a national holistic context and let them see how easy it is. Because it's not science we're lacking. It's not knowledge we're lacking. It's the inability to manage the complexity of these three things. So I'm just suggesting we have a test case of one small country, do it on the side, have the big nations of the world observe, the media observe, see how easy it is, and then take it from there and see how it can be done without any conflict, disagreement or anything. And it's, it's very like um, if you had never seen a bicycle, never heard of a bicycle, but I had developed a bicycle and I was trying to describe to you how to ride the bicycle today. The more you questioned me, the more confusing it would become. The more I described how to ride the bicycle, the more confused everyone would be. But if the two of us were together with the bicycle, you'd probably be riding it within 30 minutes. And it's like that. So I'm suggesting let's carry on arguing, fighting, feuding, doing everything we're doing, but let's take one test case of a small government somewhere and let's see what can be done under international observation. If we can do that, the downside of it is we waste a year and a few thousand dollars, a million dollars. Uh, that's the downside. No more damage than that. The upside, if we do it and it starts the domino effect of world leaders knowing that, that this problem can be solved relatively simply, the upside of it, you just can't put a monetary value to. We will save, we will save civilization as we know it. Right. Now, will that idea catch on? I don't know. I'm a very small voice. And I've had years of, of condemnation and ridicule, you know, from authorities. But, but ridicule by authority or proof by authority is not science. So we need scientists to investigate what I'm saying, not academic authorities. Right. Right. And, and, and so, I mean, wow. Um, it, it seems, though, to, to pull this back, um, it, it seems that a, a regenerative agricultural production system that focuses on soil health, for instance, not, not just have we discovered here that in, in, in some part or in some way seeks reductionism, right? Regenerative ag equals soil science is to say a carburetor e equals X into an engine. Therefore, it is reductionist and linear. But to do this well globally, to actually solve the problems that are human management, right? And understanding and managing complexity, um, that that would change on every continent to every community and society and institution. And therefore, the only way to move forward is to release practices, right? And just understand, you said it already, the holistic context, and therefore to manage complexity as it is contextually, not holistic context, but just contextually relevant, geographically, socially, culturally, community-wise, 
Is that what I'm what I'm understanding? Is that is that true? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. Um, first, let me just take you up on one word. There can be no agricultural system. That is a mechanistic worldview. Um, it, it, it no, you you only can use management systems where everything is predictable. So if you're running a business, you'd be wise to run an accounting system or an inventory control system because everything's pretty predictable. But you'd be very unwise to try to run your business on any business system. Okay, so, Got it. so running the business, running agriculture is a process of continuous management. And then the second thing, you, you focused on the soil there. No, you, the whole planet is now engaged in agriculture almost the entire planet. And only 6% of that is cropland mm. of that surface, All right? So the, the oceans are dying. The oceans are being absolutely decimated, the ocean life. The tropical forests are dying. If you take just the, the soil on the croplands, it's only 20% of the land surface. So while we are right and we have to focus on soil, Wherever we're in croplands or dealing with desertification, agriculture is wildlife management. It's timber, it's fisheries, it's, it's far more than just crop production. And so, yes, it has to be people in each situation making their decisions using all available science and knowledge in their own holistic context, their culture, their, whatever those people are, wherever. And... You know, only by doing something like that, where every person, every farmer, every farm company of their, whatever there is, is making decisions in a holistic context, have we a chance of starting the flood that saves civilization? Because floods don't start as floods. They start as little drops of rain hitting dry earth that spatters dust, and then they hit damp earth, then the water begins to run, et cetera. And so it, it's the same. You're not going to stop global problems from the top down. We've got to do it farm by farm by farm, but that has to come about through policy for the reasons we, we talked about earlier. So, so the moment, and, and we know that because we've done this in, in training exercises and real exercises with members of parliament in my own country, etc. We know that once the, the, we start managing at scale through institutions, i.e. government policy, immediately you start making it possible for individual farmers to use their creativity. Uh, one of the first questions that, that I always raise the moment we begin to do this, once we have a national holistic context that's in everybody's interest because no business can be sustained as we said without agriculture at the end so once we have that one of the first questions is well then if management every day is going to be by decisions on the land should those decisions be made by the farmer the fisherman the forester the wildlife manager or should those decisions be made in london Washington, uh, you know, Johannesburg, where should those be made? And the obvious thing is the decisions have to be made at the farm level, the fisherman level, not at the capital level. So, so now then what is government policy? If it's not to make the decisions as they do today and dictate false policies all over whole Europe and so on, all right, now the role of government in policy becomes to start rewarding actions that are in line with a national holistic context and making actions costly or difficult that are not in line. So it takes a different slant altogether. But right now, it doesn't matter what country I, I've worked in many countries, doesn't matter where I go, you can talk to farmers on the land and say, look, what you're doing is obviously wrong. You know it's wrong. You can see the damage. And they say, yes, Alan. I say, well, then why are you doing it? We're doing it because of government subsidies. We're doing it because of extension advice. We're doing it because of government policies. And I met this in Spain, in Germany, in Australia. It doesn't matter where I go. America, it is our government agricultural policies that are leading 
to agriculture being as destructive as it is. And it's in nobody's interest, not in the interests of big corporations in the end or anybody else. And we need to get beyond blaming. It's, it's nobody's fault. We didn't know what was causing it, this inability to manage complexity. So when, when we get into blaming, it's like blaming somebody for not flying before the Wright brothers did. Somebody must be guilty. Who the hell do we blame? The answer is we blame nobody. I think we need to stop the blaming, whether we're blaming corporations or politicians or anything else, and start just addressing the cause. It, it seems in, in a world infatuated with practice, right, of prescriptions of complicated in, in instruction or manual sets, that, that this competition, this, this, this blaming mechanism just rises and rises to the surface. Do, do you think, one, that, that that is true, but also, two, by stepping out of that conversation, right, by not talking about soil only or communities only or cover cropping only or just 6% of the soil, let alone the oceans and everything else, by stepping outside of that, that practice, um, can, can we actually affect change globally? Or is that possible within the understanding of practice, right? The blame game and everything else. You know, by stepping out of it, changing the conversation, all the things that are going on with internet and conferences and people are doing at COP26 as we speak, that is the only known way of change. I don't think there's any other known way historically, except that people talk and talk and talk and, and ideas spread and so on. And we know from research, from history, from everything available to us, from science, that when you have to take a new direction, like we do now, and shift from a mechanistic worldview to a holistic worldview, and we've discovered how to do that, we know that if we take the incremental change route, you can guarantee a minimum of 200 years before it becomes institutionalized, if you heed the science, history, the research, etc. And I don't think young generations have got that time. That's why I'm trying to spend the last years of my life, because I'm 86 now and fading fast. I'd like to spend the last years of my life seeing if we can't bring the Berlin Wall down more rapidly by the suggestion I made today of why not let's just take one test case, a small country. We could do it where I am, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, because in our case there, um, I'm surrounded by 30 national parks in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, Namibia. So there's 30 national parks there. Now, nobody intends them to do anything except save biodiversity. That's the whole purpose. But if you go and visit those national parks, and I'm frequently taking people there, and I've taken National Geographic, uh, you know, and other photographers there to see it, they are our worst examples in many instances of biodiversity loss, contribution to future pandemics, climate change. Now, in those cases, we can't blame corporate greed. We can't blame uh, livestock. There isn't there are national parks. We can't blame anything, coal, oil, gas, uh, corruption. What, what can we blame? We can't blame hunting. We can't blame too many animals. Some of them have few, very few animals. In the national parks near I, where I lived for 40 years in New Mexico, we had the same thing. Okay, so there's nothing left to blame. We have to start acknowledging it's our management as professional people in environmental organizations, governments, universities, etc., cattlemen's organizations, etc. So let's start taking a test case, and it could be one near us, where we look at agriculture first and just show what can be done. Mm -hmm. Because almost everybody is trying to do the right thing. People aren't deliberately trying to do the wrong thing. That's why there's so many voices, so much uh, sound, so many people demanding attention, their idea. And I'm suggesting one. Why don't we just do this? Because I know what the result will be. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's it's, it's interesting for those uh, on on this on, on this webinar uh, who may not be familiar with holistic management. Um, there's there's a, a an idea there. Obviously, Alan has mentioned it many times. Holistic context. Um, and one of the more interesting things about actually diving into understanding what is the holistic context and applying it, elucidating it in your own life, professional, personal, relational, whatever it is, institutional, that would be an unbelievable thing if nations actually had holistic context, um, is defining the whole under management. And again, Alan, please critique every word that I'm using to make sure that it's true and good and beautiful, but it's that defining of the whole under management. Right, it's that um, that that boundary, if you will, on what is our whole, what are we able to manage, you know, and, and you move forward from there. But it's it's a moment that when you know we're a hub with Savory, we teach a lot of holistic management courses, and it's it's always my favorite part, teaching the holistic context and watching people's eyes at first gloss over, right, and disinterest. What do you mean I have to define who are the decision makers, right, in my whole? That's that's one of the one of the items that you, that you go through when you're forming your own holistic context and your whole under management is defining decision makers. And then all of a sudden, after they do that very benign, modest, very simple task of saying, you know, Daniel Morgan, my wife, we are the decision makers of Tim Shaw Wildland, our 400 acre farm here in central Virginia. And then you actually start living your life via the rest of that holistic context. And you realize how powerful it is, right, to have on paper that the two minds, the two souls, the two hearts that matter for the managing the complexity of our whole, which in this case is the farm, right? Tim Shaw Wildland, it's unbelievable. It's absolutely unbelievable. And so maybe, you know, as we shift towards the last part of this webinar, um, what I'm hearing, and I wanna make sure this is accurate by you, um, it, it seems like next steps here, right? For the entire world and for everybody on this, on this, on this webinar is, understand humans are the problem, that managing complexity is the issue at hand and it's also the solvent, uh, and that we need to do it personally in our whole, right? But also work via our community in a larger institutionalized sense to do it at a much larger scale or else it will take 200 years. But we do need both of those items. Is that what you're saying. So that, that's basically right. But at the individual level, everybody can, um, even a person working in a town in a job can begin to manage their lives holistically. And I could give you an example of that utter simplicity. Um, but only to a point, because at the institutional scale is where the economy is. So, so you, you know, we, we said it earlier, we can only do it to a certain point. So what we've got to do is try to get institutional change quicker because then education can reflect it, extension services can reflect it, agricultural policies can reflect it, energy policies can begin to reflect it, immigration policies, drug policies, whatever. Because it doesn't matter what policy you look at, they lead to unintended consequences today. Uh, America's war on terror, increasing terror, America's war on drugs, increased drugs use. You know, it just goes on and on. Um, so, so we can begin to have institutions address all of these uh, policies, but begin with agriculture. And then, yes, it will lead to um, massive more training and less confusion education to, to farmers on the land to help them speed the process. We, we need to get the two working together. And um, the, the key to it, as you've said, is deciding what you're managing. So in, in the case of an individual, it's just yourself and your job. And if there are no other decision makers, you develop the holistic context for yourself. And if it's a case of a, of a government um, policy like agriculture, then we put a small team together first to say, well, who does this affect? And we realize it affects everybody. There's nobody not affected by agriculture. So then you start getting re uh, people representatives of the different church groups, women's groups, whatever, uh, businesses, captains of industry, uh, universities, academics, experts. You start getting them together as the people that need to develop the holistic context. Because if they don't develop it themselves, they oppose it. That's just human nature. Uh, because of our egos. Um, so we have to involve everybody in developing 
the context, the holistic context that is going to guide the actions. After that, it goes smoothly. The, the most difficult thing to do in managing holistically is just to develop the holistic context with the right people at the table and with deep, deep commitment. You want to live your life like this more than anything in life. Nothing should be more important to you. Don't say your children are, they should be included. Don't say your religion is, it should be included. You, you can't escape it. Once you develop this concept, which as I said, is not in any branch of science, philosophy, or religion. Once you develop that concept, you, you realize how deep it is and that's how you want your life to be tied to your life support behavior. And that's the most difficult thing. After that, everything becomes relatively easy. And the other thing when we develop a holistic context is there's never any compromise. So even if we do it with a very mixed group of people who are in total conflict today, we just keep uh, um, helping them through it until there's no compromise and everybody's agreed. And I've, I've had angry groups swearing at me and telling me to bugger off back to Africa that it's impossible to have agreement in their community. And I've got them to agree to work with me just for one hour and prove me wrong, which they've agreed to do. And an hour later, they're in total agreement. You know, most humans are wanting the same thing. We just don't know it. There are very few humans aren't wanting better health, cleaner food, cleaner water, cleaner air, more prosperity, more stability, more security, more freedom to pursue their own spiritual values. It's hard to find humans that don't want that. But we're killing each other because we're trying to meet different needs, desires, etc. It, it, it seems like the formation of a holistic context is, is imperative, even if you don't feel like you're managing anything. Well, right? you, you, can't, you can't do it without it. Right. <laughs> right. Wow. I, so, okay. So it's, it's getting late. We could talk all day. Um, I want to jump over to the question and answers because we, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question, it was actually asked offhand and the individual is not here today uh, to ask. And so I want to, and, and, and I think it's a very potent question, um, but uh, your ability to speak simply, I think, and think simply is going to be able to handle it like we need you to handle it. Can, and the question is this, so let's see if I can even say it properly. Can you manage, let's say, a farm holistically and have that farm D with a D generate? So can you manage a farm holistically and that farm be a degenerative farm? Is that it's possible? Absolutely possible for a short period. So sometimes we have to do the wrong thing uh, because when you look at the holistic framework, um, we, we uh, look at our action, we look at it to see that it's in line with the context, etc. And then we have seven checks to see that we're in line. And one of them is what we call the weak link social. We say before taking this action, will it so anger people in my community uh, that it will cause conflict and delay everything for years? It and cause an absolute logjam. And if the answer to that question, it, it, as you look at it, is yes, then you'll go ahead with the wrong action, mm. knowing it's doing damage, but not offending everybody in your community while you buy time to educate or find your way around that problem. But you keep everything else going. So, yes, yes I've had to do that myself, take wrong actions at, at times just to keep things going. Mm. And then you get around it and you move on. But if you don't do that, you hit a log jam and you, you never move on. Right. You just end in conflict. This is why, for instance, in uh, developing national parks policies in Africa, we absolutely cannot even do it without World Wildlife Fund and the major international organizations there because we will create a log jam. They will not accept the solution unless they devise a solution. We know that. So we are going ahead and doing damage while we try to find some way to get somebody in the world powerful enough to convene and get them to work with us. Makes sense. 
makes sense. Absolutely. Um, let's, I think every, every one of the questions that I've asked that you've answered, I want to have a whole webinar dedicated to just continuing it. Um, my mind is lost, but let's move on to the questions because um, we have a couple here. So one, Edmund, uh, if institutions can only defend the prevailing view and reflect the beliefs of the general population, then why focus on agricultural policy created by institutions? Why not focus on using the internet to spread knowledge of holistic management to reduce the 100 years? Well, you can't because if you use inter internet and spread it just by through people, that's what takes 100 to 200 years. It took the Royal Navy 200 years to accept lime juice would stop scurvy and nothing has changed. Those were brilliant men. It took the merchant navy another 70 years after that. A million sailors died. Britain's entire security depended on the navy. Okay, so nothing has changed. Um, so we have to do what I've said, either go doing that for the next 100, 200 years and pray hard, or we have to try what I'm suggesting is one internationally observed test case so that institutions learn quickly that there is a solution to this, that they are blocking. Got it, got it. Another question, would carbon farming be a possible new income source for regenerative agrarians? Where does carbon farming exist into this idea of yours? I, I don't ever get into that. You, you, everything is carbon. There's no farmer that's not carbon farming. Life is carbon. You can't be carbon zero. There's, they will have no life. And I never get into the carbon trading or any of these things, because in my personal view, they're wrong. We, it's, we're wrong to pay people to do the wrong thing while rewarding other people for doing, you know, for it. It's, Having the money. Yeah, if you had policies that were developed holistically, you wouldn't need to do that. These are band-aids to try and make the best of a messy situation. Got it. This next question, it deals in the creation of institutions. So not the molding or mending or remediating, but the creating of institutions. He asks, uh, or they ask, can we, how can we create institutions of holistic communities that scale quickly enough and with enough effect that it is wor more worthwhile than trying to change our current institutions? You, you, this, these are wicked problems. They haven't been solved for 10,000 years. Okay, these three wicked problems. The one of not accepting new knowledge, I don't think we'll probably ever solve. That's why I'm suggesting a way around it. The other two, the lack of common sense and the defending the institution at the cost of even going against its mission, all right? I believe that when institutions manage holistically, people may overcome those two. But wicked problems are defined as that because they are almost impossible to solve. But very few people are ever talking about them, and they are endangering humanity now. So at least we need to start talking about them, and I've suggested a way forward. Yeah. It's, the, the, it's not the people in the organizations. It, it was far-sighted people in the USDA that engaged me to train 2,000 scientists, World Bank economists, um, university professors, et cetera, over two years in the early 80s. We got to the point of them recognizing that unsound resource management was universal in the United States. We published that statement in my textbook. We were in the planning stage to train 17,000 US Forest Service personnel, and then suddenly, all training was banned of officials and America was set back 35 years. That's institutional behavior. Now, it was bureaucrats within that institution that were as puzzled as I was. They were stunned as I was. None of us understood why the institution that had brought about so much progress suddenly on the authority of a couple of university professors banned all further training. I don't know. I mean, I, I keep thinking about your 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 idea and this, and it's the idea that 
I mean, what? It's it's demonstration, right? In in some sense. Well, um, I wouldn't call it a demonstration. They would participate with us. If I demonstrate something, I, I made that mistake long ago, the charter trials, the first international trial that was to end the controversy always uh, for all time. And it didn't, it just magnified the, the controversy. And a wiser person than me said, of course it did, Alan, look what you did. You demonstrated how clever you were and how stupid they were. Well, that wasn't my intention. It was an international demonstration of holistic plan grazing as it is today. It was wonderfully successful, but it backfired totally because of the word demonstration. So I don't believe in demonstrations. I only believe in learning sites and learning together and working with people, not demonstrating how clever we are. That's why you'll very seldom see from me any contrast photographs with neighboring land because you're showing up the neighbor badly. So I tend to show fixed point photographs of the change we've made on this land so that we can all lo learn together without offending each other. Because our egos are the biggest vested interest in the world, bigger than even financial vested interests. Right, right. I mean, it, it goes back to that, to that the idea. Uh, we were talking about it earlier with, with this idea of practice. When you're pushing practice, you can't but compete. Right, it, it's competition versus collaboration, if you will, and it seems to me like holistic management is the idea of collaboration, right? Of contextualized really between us and collaboration. We can't do it any other way. Right. Unfortunately, many people see it as some sort of management system as competing with them. Well, that's just misunderstanding, right? Because it doesn't compete, and uh, like anybody today is managing every single human is managing in reductionist management. They're not competing with that. And all we're suggesting is, well, switch from reductionist management to holistic management, and you get very different results. Right, right, for, for all, I mean, to be put some clarity there, um, like it's needed, but I mean, different results in, in the whole sphere of, life, right? Not just soil health, not just biodiversity in the grasslands, but, you know, regenerating actual communities and institutions and collaborative type societies. I mean, we're talking the, the, the outcome that you get isn't just agricultural, right? I mean, good food is one thing, but even the fostering and nurturing of good food doesn't end at the end of agriculture. No, that's why I said earlier, if we just start with an agricultural policy, the next one, obviously, to tackle would be an energy policy. So you do the same. Take any small nation uh, initially, because they're the easiest to change, and get who's affected by energy. Well, everybody is. We could probably use the same holistic context, national one that we've developed for agriculture. Now let's look at energy in that light, not energy in the case where the reason is need, desire, or problem, and that's the context as well. Let's still have the energy needs, the desires, the problems to solve, but let's solve them in a national holistic context that is in everybody's interest, including the corporate uh, billionaires and everybody else that today are inadvertently, in many cases, destroying the world. Right, right. Let's, um, in, in respect of your time, I think this last question is, is a brilliant end to the entire um, session here, but Brandon asks, how can we help you, Alan, in growing this vision? What, what can we do to, to, to further what you've been pushing? Um, it just, if you could somehow, by some magic, have a million people write to Prince William and say, take up the suggestion that's just been made hmm. at COP. 26, because I've mentioned him, I've written to him. The Royal Foundation could lead, they've got the convening power. The Royal Society is the oldest society, scientific society of any nation in the world. They could investigate one-on-one -on -one with what I'm saying. And if, it, if a million people uh, signed a petition to him, it would happen. That's the best thing anybody could do for humanity at the moment. Is, um, is save, I mean, just because this is very practical, is Savory or anybody within the Institute managing such a petition? I mean, 
it, it seems to me like this could be a thing that can get done. Well, we, we would provide the facilitation skill on it. That's all we can do. Right. The, the, what, whichever nation we picked uh, to do that, they would have the experts internationally. We've got the experts. There's, there's no lack of scientific knowledge. We would just provide the expertise and how you, how you develop policy in a context where the institutions develop it and the economy and managing nature together inseparably right the knowledge to do it is there powerful powerful alan i uh i, I didn't I, I tried to keep all expectations for this webinar um just as hidden and silent in my own self as possible um i've talked with you only a number of times over the past few few years and every time yesterday after our call i looked at my wife um and i said yeah i i, I need a nap I mean, not, not because it was exhausting, but just, I feel like my whole life is changing. Um, and, and your perspective, you know, I think we get so lost. I, I do. I think we get so lost in this regenerative movement and the understanding and development of practice and movement and noise for the sake of practice, movement and noise. That when we hear a lesson so simple, almost so mundane, so human, so filled with humdrummery that the solution to life's problems, right? The solution to, you know, my children, they're all young, having air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat that is in chemical goo and, you know, all created in a laboratory because there is no more earth left, right? Um, the solution is simplicity. And, and, and not that there's no complexity, right? But that we, that, the, that our participation in managing that complexity is so simple right through the holistic context and everything else that you've elucidated. And so for that, such a simple and reminding message, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you for helping spread it. Get that petition going, a million people and we'll save the world. Got it. I like it. Everybody listening, um, let's do it. We are, we are totally in. Alan, thank you for your time. Well, we deeply, you, deeply thank you. Thank you. Yes.